Remember Star Trek? It's back in pog form! Also, we're doing another silly video analyzing an episode that wasn't that great. But to understand why The Naked Now was such a stinker, it's worth exploring the episode it copies wholesale, The Naked Time. So let's enter a time warp and travel back to 1966. The Naked Time was the fourth episode overall for Star Trek The Original Series, focusing on a contagion that slowly infects the crew and lowers their inhibitions. Most people probably recall this is the episode where Sulu runs around the ship shirtless with a sword, which I think gives the false impression that it's more of a comedy. But actually, the episode is quite creepy at times. It begins with the discovery of several dead scientists, frozen in nonsensical and horrific ways. Why would they be showering in their clothes or playing with the controls while their deaths were imminent? Then, whatever infected them slowly starts to affect the people on the Enterprise. One officer commits suicide despite barely injuring himself, another takes over the ship and sends them hurtling toward a disintegrating planet. There's a particularly unsettling scene where Lieutenant Riley asks Nurse Chapel about his friend's death and seems utterly unaffected by it. You know something? You have such lovely eyes, pretty lady. It's a really unnerving atmosphere as the madness insidiously takes over. It reminded me a bit of Event Horizon when they discover what happened to the previous crew. The mystery of the unknown, the creeping terror that can come from anyone around you. But the contagion doesn't inherently make someone murderous or suicidal, it simply strips down the person to their base wants or feelings. This, in turn, leads to some rather poignant and affecting moments. Nurse Chapel is in love with Spock. Kirk feels incredible loneliness because of his duties as captain. When it eventually gets to Spock, he breaks down weeping, losing control of his emotions as he struggles with his human side. He's Vulcan, but he isn't an emotionless robot. He feels deeply, and yet that emotion brings him great shame. I feel friendship for you. I'm ashamed. You've got to hear me! It's the most powerful scene of the episode and, incredibly, was improvised in one take by Leonard Nimoy. It's one of the first moments that cements who Spock is and builds up his layered history. The scene is unscored, simple, and moving. The Naked Time is one of the best episodes of the original series, and it was purposefully done early on to quickly introduce the audience to the characters. Because the contagion breaks down their walls, you get a good idea of what they're all about. It's effective because not only does it play with the characters, but it takes its time doing it, setting up a chilling atmosphere as the ship heads to certain doom. Our main characters aren't infected right away, it's a survival situation as they try to regain control of the ship. And when you get to the character moments, they feel satisfying and earned. Here's who they are on the surface, and here's who they are when you dig a little deeper. Fast forward a couple decades and we're at the naked now! In sharp contrast, this is maybe one of the worst episodes of The Next Generation. You might recall that the show had a pretty rough start, mostly due to a lot of silly ideas Gene Roddenberry had. Everyone acts all stilted and weird, and there's this strange holdover from the 60s vibe that doesn't fit 1987 at all. He also seemed to have forgotten everything that worked about the show in the 60s, so it feels dated and bad. On top of that, fans were pretty pissed about continuing Star Trek without the characters they knew and loved, so Next Gen had a lot to prove in forging its own identity. So naturally, Gene Roddenberry thought it'd be a great idea if they just recycle plots from the original series, but beef them up with a better budget. Which, I guess on paper, sounds like it might work, but remember, at this point, fans thought this was going to be a bad copy anyway. And like, okay, if you're going to reimagine plots from the original show, you could maybe not copy the story so beat for beat. And writer DC Fontana did not set out to do that at all. In fact, she has to have her name removed from the credits because her script was significantly rewritten. This was another reason why the first and second season stunk on ice, because Roddenberry, and apparently his attorney, would frequently take scripts and rewrite them. According to Fontana, while the script was given a good reaction by almost everyone, the Roddenberry pattern of dealing with scripts befell it. After a staffer turned in the official second draft of the script, they were not allowed to touch it again. No matter how good a script appeared to be, it would be rewritten by Gene Roddenberry. 
if possible, scenes of sexual content would be inserted into the script. When two such scenes were put into the Naked Now, in addition to other scenes which I felt debased the female characters of the series, I put my sentiments into a frankly worded memo of comment on the script. My comments were ignored. Roddenberry was too horny, creepily horny, all the time, and boy can you tell! In fact, there was apparently a music cue written for this called Horny Doctor that got cut, but that's because Rick Berman asked composer Ron Jones if he could write anything non-emotional. Because those pesky emotions, am I right? Roddenberry probably would have insisted if he knew the name of the track, though. Dude was always talking about Ferengis having huge junk and alien chick should have multiple breasts, and I don't know, man, how did he create Star Trek? Did you know it was apparently his dream since the 70s to write an android sex scene? He pitched the idea for a pilot and got shot down. But oh, at last, he got his android sex scene. And what a scene it was. A dream fulfilled. From you, Data, you are fully functional, aren't you? Of course, but... How fully? In every way, of course. If vital to an exchange of information, I am fully functional. So given what we know about Roddenberry being way, way too focused on sex, that is a lot of what this episode feels like. People who are drunk and in heat. Unlike The Naked Time, this is overtly a comedy episode, which could still be used to explore characters, and is done effectively in later episodes such as Data's Day, but is instead used for sex gags and annoying Wesley moments. It's not a story about who these characters are so much as who they aren't. What little pieces of their personality we see are lost for comedy moments meant to demonstrate how out of character this person is acting. But the problem here is that we don't know who the hell anyone is at this point. This was the first episode they did after the pilot. So after that jellyfish-filled disaster with Picard pulling rank so Riker would make him look good around kids and crying Troy and delicious apples and grappler zorns, we're then treated to this crew of idiots being horny dipshits. Pretty cool, huh? I think Will Wheaton summed it up pretty well in 2006. The Naked Now has some genuinely funny moments, but it was only the second time after the series pilot, Encounter at Farpoint, that audiences had seen us. And this episode was not the best way to introduce the audience to a new show, with a new cast, especially when we all knew we were standing on the shoulders of giants. So now that we know why the same story worked once but failed twice, let's take a look at the Naked Time, the crappy version. The Enterprise has been receiving strange messages from a research vessel they're supposed to rendezvous with. Our first shot is Data and his uncomfortable Lazy Boy, which has switched sides from the pilot, a factoid I threw in for the nerds out there. We are also introduced to Troy's Season 1 look, a bejeweled headpiece with her hair in a bun, I guess, and dumbass grey jumpsuit. I just found out now it was denim. Why would they choose this particular material? And it's got this ruched built-in sash? God! Do it! Yeah, go ahead! Woo! Ha <laughs> ha Do it! Pain! Such pain! Eh, just kidding. She's calmed down a lot since the pilot. Anyway, the research vessel was partying it up and blew their emergency hatch. Now the Enterprise crew must investigate the scene and find out just what the hell happened. Indications of what humans would call a wild party? On the one hand, Brent Spiner probably hated this line. On the other hand, you don't get these kind of chuckles with prestige trek. They were all sucked out into space. Correction, sir. That's blown out. Are you seriously, seriously gonna fucking actually me right now, Data? Remember how in the 60s they found the frozen corpses and it was super creepy, despite the fact one of the bodies was very clearly a mannequin? Well, what if it was just a bunch of people in underpants and artfully placed censorship napkins? Still feeling chills? And I'm sorry, maybe we should be judging this episode on its own merit, but at least Spock and Dead Meat No. 1 had the decency to wear thermal suits made out of shower curtains. Geordi's just wandering in without anything like no big deal. Hey, maybe he should get into his underpants. Seems safe. At this point in time, Geordi is the main character who is the most expendable, so of course he's immediately infected. After completing their inspection, Riker informs Picard that all 80 people on the ship are dead. How do we feel about this situation? Can we get a music cue? Why is Troy there while Crusher looks over the tricorder readings? Is she gonna pick up some emotions from the computer? Maybe she's just trying to walk around and break in her jumpsuit. <laughs> anyway, Crusher ain't got shit. 
Picard decides to call the away team back and have them decontaminated and observed. And I kind of feel like if you need to be decontaminated, you could have had them in hazmat suits to begin with. And looky here, it's old no personal space Riker hovering over everyone unnecessarily. Does this bug you? I'm not touching you. Normal all across. Except, why are you perspiring, Lieutenant? Yeah, I guess him sweating buckets might have been a clue something was up, but boy, those readings, let me tell ya. Jordy is acting kind of weird, so it's time for Riker to sit on some controls. Data, I need help in locating some library computer information. Specific, sir? All I have is a vague memory of reading somewhere about some- So Riker has this vague memory of reading something at some point in time in some place about someone showering in their clothes. So he asks Data to look into it. He is, of course, remembering some logs about the original incident in The Naked Time. But like, someone showered in their clothes once is kind of strange, but I doubt rare enough that it only ever occurred one other time in history. To someone, somewhere. Damn, it was impossible to stop Jordy from wandering out of sick bay. The events that take place in this episode were simply unavoidable. He couldn't help it. You see, Jordy just had this incredible urge to go see Wesley for some reason. Jordy and Wesley, the duo that always hung out. So that's your science project, huh? Wes, you're really something. <laughs> Jordy's always asking about my science projects. Look, I don't mean to travel on well-trodden dunks, but Wesley is a fucking dork. I mean, he's created a voice simulator so he can pretend he's being given orders by Captain Picard and flying the ship. He's basically using his immeasurable genius to play pretend. Other 15-year-olds would be giving him a wedgie right around this point. Absolute wiener. And it's not lost on me that he's telling the guy who currently pilots the ship that he's gunning for his job. Anyway, scene over. I guess Wesley didn't think it was weird when Jordy wandered out of the room feeling sick and muttering to himself. Not gonna mention that to anyone. Hey, did you know Jordy is blind? Jordy, please put this I wanna see in shallow, dim, beautiful, human ways. If you're looking for a human being, you're not gonna find one this season. At this stage, it should probably be obvious that a contagion is involved, or at least a possibility, and yet no one takes any precautions at any time. Crusher again notes that all of their readings are coming back normal, so I guess they shouldn't use common sense or observe what's right in front of them. Troy, do you feel anything unusual in the lieutenant? I'll take this from here, Troy. You go fix us some coffee or whatever the hell it is you do. This is the one thing I'm here for, dammit. Just give me one thing. Did you hear something, Doctor? <laughs> Hey, here's some trivia for you. This picture that quickly flashes across the screen is Gene Roddenberry's head on a parrot. Apparently this is a cheeky reference to his nickname, the Great Bird of the Galaxy. Uh, whoopst. Anyway, Data's found the showering in their clothes incident, somehow, and Riker is immediately telling Picard they have the answer to what's going on, despite the fact he doesn't even know what Data has or if there are any similarities whatsoever outside of said clothes showering. But as we all know, he is in fact correct, and this is the episode they are badly copying. Acted on the brain like alcohol. Yeah. Well, time to weep into my tampons or something. Wait a minute. You always wear such beautiful clothes off duty. And your hair always looks so nice. Number one, it seems our security chief has the equivalent of a snootful. <laughs> Sir Patrick Stewart, everyone. Forget it. Ah, 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 ah. Staying alive, staying alive. Ah, 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 ah. Staying alive. Here's where we're introduced to arguably one of the most important characters in all of Star Trek, Assistant Chief Engineer Jim Shimoda. Some people say he was just a pale imitation of Groppler Zorn, but I feel both characters have their own strengths and weaknesses. Anyway, Wesley uses his voice simulator to call rotating Chief Engineer McDougal to the bridge and then Shimoda to sickbay and then volunteers to watch the place while he's gone. Shimoda immediately agrees, which you could blame on the drunk virus, but more than likely is because in season one, they just do things like that. Effective immediately, I have handed over control of this vessel to acting Captain Wesley Crusher. Oh, damn it, Wesley. This wouldn't have happened if Riker had made me look cool in front of him. And henceforth, a dessert course shall precede and follow 
every meal. Okay, this is an almost exact copy of the part where Riley says he wants ice cream for everyone, but I do think, to be fair, that is something an annoying baby would request if he suddenly had control of a starship. Enough of this negativity! I'm over it! I'm here to see a beloved sci-fi creator's dreams come true. Ladies and gentlemen, Data has sex. You should get into uniform. But I got out of my uniform for you, Data. Do you know how old I was when I was abandoned? Five years old. I learned how to stay alive, how to avoid the rape gangs. And what I want now is gentleness and joy and love. From you, Data, you are fully functional, aren't you? Of course, but... How fully? In every way, of course. I am programmed in multiple techniques, a broad variety of pleasuring. You jewel, that's exactly what I hoped. Alright, so there's a lot to unpack here. Analysis time, analysis. What can we learn from this scene? Well, a lot, actually? This is one of the most what-the-fuck, batshit insane moments that ever happened on the show, and yet it is somehow incredibly significant in multiple ways, a broad variety of lore. No, uh, not that lore. Quite unfortunately, this episode is one of the few times we get to hear anything about Yar's tragic past. If you're thinking that perhaps it's misguided and even kinda gross to include her backstory about escaping rape gangs from the age of five in the comedy android sex scene, congratulations, you have more critical thought than Gene Roddenberry. Perhaps it was also a mistake to put her in genie harem pants that point down to her crotch, paired with an underboob shirt and a weird little hair swirl, which is less sexy and more a total clown show. But nonetheless, this is sadly the scene that gives us the most about who one of the characters is, which was the idea of producing this episode so early. Yar survived in a hostile world without real love, and now she seeks something genuine and good, like robot sex. Judging by her complete denial of it ever occurring by the end of the episode, I'm gonna guess it wasn't Yar's proudest moment. But this is, in fact, meaningful for Data. He strives to be human, and this is part of the human experience. Which is why having sex with Yar is recorded in a landmark legal case determining if androids have rights. He alludes to having sex with Yar multiple times through the run of the show and even into the movies. Despite not having emotions, he feels some sort of connection to her. It is seemingly his first time having sex, despite the fact he is fully functional and programmed in multiple techniques. Although, to be fair, that's a little nebulous. And never really clarified, so if you're looking up uh, how many times Data had sex or, or if he lost his uh, robot virginity here, uh, Twitter, let me know. There's no no canon for that, so, so I did my due diligence. But hey, while I'm talking about it, was Data a sex bot? Like, why did Soong feel that was necessary? I mean, as a general concept, I guess I get why someone would create a sex bot, but he looks exactly like him. It's a self-sex bot. What is happening? I don't really know what we're watching at this point, but I think we can all agree on one thing. We will never be on Shimoda's level. Bill. Who the hell is Bill? Three-fourths of the way into the episode, the ship's doctor suddenly realizes people should probably stop touching each other with this infectious whatever-the-hell-around. Informing Riker that he's probably got it, he says they're gonna be killed by that collapsed star I just now mentioned if they don't get control of the ship back from Wesley. So just infect everyone, who cares? It doesn't really matter, because uh, even though Riker's infected longer than some other people, never really does anything to him. I don't know. I don't know. I feel strange, but also good. I... <laughs> As you can see by Data's goofy sex smile and immediate willingness to ignore the captain's orders so we can go to Bone Town, they hadn't quite nailed down his character yet. Maybe I shouldn't have said nailed down. Eh, I guess they hadn't figured out how emotional or horny he should be. But you know what makes absolute sense? A robot getting infected by a virus. We are more alike than unlike, my dear captain. I have pores. Humans have pores. Fingerprints. My chemical nutrients are like your blood. If you prick me, do I not leak? What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. There must be a cure, some formula. <laughs> Why does Picard make this noise? What is the intention behind this acting choice? I could play this on a loop, and I will. Here, look. 
I am both fascinated and embarrassed. Speaking of which, sexism. I'm a woman. I haven't had the comfort of a husband. Hard to believe Gates McFadden was fired for speaking up when something was racist or sexist. How could she see anything wrong with this perfect show? On an interesting side note, apparently this was the episode she was given for her audition, so she thought Crusher was gonna be comic relief. At this point, Worf turns into a little snitch and decides to contact Riker about everyone being infected on the bridge. <laughs> Riker, who knows he himself is infected, leaves the post he insisted on going to infected to save the ship so he can take care of it. Somehow. And by take care of it, I mean stand behind the captain and see how it goes. Yay! Meanwhile, uh, McDougal is somehow saving the day? This rando we'll never see again? Like, I mean, surely Riker would have been more useful staying there and helping them gain control of the ship? Unfortunately, she's an engineer, not a miracle worker, and she can't put all of the isolinear chips Shimoda removed back in time. Perhaps a sex robot can save the day? they're running out of time, so it's up to Wunderkind Wesley to work his genius via magic bullshit and buy them a few extra minutes. Thanks, adult idiots, but you weren't needed. Also, the cure from the original incident didn't work, so Crusher just made, like, a more powerful version, I guess. I don't know, just, just pumped out the same thing. Everyone's good now. Wesley may have given us a few seconds, too. Did he say Wesley? The boy? I know, we just gotta power through these first couple seasons and I swear it gets better. I think we can all agree, Wesley deserves a hearty pat on the back for endangering us all and then getting us out of the situation. Hooray, Hooray Wesley! Wesley! I'll try not to be as repetitious as making the naked now in the first place, but basically, yeah, it was a bad copy. Nothing that worked about the naked time was present here, and what was changed just made our main characters look like idiots. No one seems to connect the dots when they should or use any common sense before being infected with the drunk horny virus. The sex scenes that were inserted into the script are extremely embarrassing, and there's no moments of sincerity to really ground it in anything. While it makes for a hilarious rewatch, it is a complete mess. But at least we know that Data is fully functional, and that is the most important lesson of all. <laughs>